Neptune is the eighth planet out from our Sun. It's so far out in the solar system that the light from our Sun takes over four hours to reach it. According to evolutionary models, Neptune is old, cold, and dead. It's supposedly billions of years old after all. But unfortunately for evolutionary models, Neptune doesn't look either old, cold, or dead. First of all, Neptune isn't cold. Yes, it's a colder place than Earth, but our space probes have discovered that it's not as cold as evolutionists expected. Instead, the planet radiates into space about twice the energy it receives from the Sun. Neptune isn't dead either. It turns out Neptune is a violent, turbulent place. It has the strongest winds measured anywhere in the solar system. We've measured wind speeds there up to 1300 miles per hour. This is called the Great Dark Spot. It's a massive storm system roughly the size of Earth, or at least it was. A few years after this photograph was taken by Voyager in 1989, NASA took more pictures of Neptune with the Hubble Space Telescope. The new photographs showed that the dark spot has disappeared. Since then, a new one has been discovered in a different location. Neptune is a dynamic, ever-changing planet. Neptune looks neither cold nor dead. Apparently, it's not old either. Neptune also confounds evolutionary theories with its magnetic field. We've seen that over and over again, the magnetic fields in the solar system have falsified evolutionary models. Well, Neptune is no different. We had a hint of the problem already before our first spacecraft even reached Neptune. When Voyager 2 was on its way to Neptune, it visited Uranus first. I already told you that according to evolution, Uranus wasn't supposed to have much of a magnetic field, but it does. There was another surprise, though, that I didn't mention. Not only was Uranus's magnetic field much stronger than the evolutionists expected, it was also tilted and offset from the center of the planet. Evolutionists couldn't make sense of this at all. It doesn't match their models at all. So they scratched their heads and said, well, maybe Voyager flew by just as Uranus's magnetic field was reversing. This would have been very unlikely, although not impossible. But then, three years later, Voyager arrived at Neptune, and guess what? Neptune's magnetic field is also tilted and offset from the planet's center. Evolutionists were forced to acknowledge that it seems that the possibility of finding two planets both experiencing magnetic polarity reversals is small. So far, we've seen that Neptune has produced lots of bad news for the evolutionary model. But there's an even bigger problem that I haven't told you about yet. According to evolutionary models, Neptune can't exist at all. Here's how Astronomy Magazine explained it. Psst. Astronomers who model the formation of a solar system have kept a dirty little secret. Uranus and Neptune don't exist. Or at least computer simulations have never explained how planets as big as the two gas giants could form so far from the Sun. Bodies orbited so slowly in the outer parts of the Sun's protoplanetary disk that the slow process of gravitational accretion would need more time than the age of the solar system to form bodies with 14 and a half and 17.1 times the mass of Earth. Did you catch that? According to evolution, Uranus and Neptune don't exist. Well, last time I checked, both planets were still up there in the sky. Evolutionists are unhappy that their model is such a failure. As one evolutionary astronomer has commented, what is clear is that simple banging together of planetesimals to construct planets takes too long in this remote outer part of the solar system. The time needed exceeds the age of the solar system. We see Uranus and Neptune, but the modest requirement that these planets exist has not been met by this model. Let's ask an important question here. How long has this problem been known? Here's another evolutionist. There have been many attempts to model the evolution of a swarm of colliding planetesimals. Safranov calculated the characteristic timescales for planetary growth. In the terrestrial region, he found timescales of 10 to the 7 years. That's a one with seven zeros after it. But the time estimates increased rapidly in the outer regions of the solar system and was 10 to the 10 years for Neptune, which is twice the age of the solar system. It is clear that in view of the large timescales found for the formation of the outer planets, a satisfactory theoretical model for the accretion of planets from diffuse material is not available at present. Okay, so this problem was first discovered by a scientist named Safranov. Was this a recent discovery? Nope. Safranov published this in 1972. So evolutionists have known for over 30 years that Uranus and Neptune can't exist according to their models. Did you hear about this in Time Magazine? or in the newspaper, or in a science program? I bet you haven't. In fact, I bet you've been told the opposite. I bet you've been told that evolutionists have the entire solar system figured out, and that they know exactly how it all formed all by itself billions of years ago. 
Now you know that this is a falsehood. Here's a quote from another evolutionary astronomer. He says this, It's clear that our level of sophistication of studying planet formation is relatively primitive. So far, it's been very difficult for anybody to come up with a scenario that actually produces Uranus and Neptune. Come up with a scenario. That's a very interesting statement. In fact, it really reveals the heart of the matter. The goal of the evolutionist is to come up with a scenario about how everything got here without a creator being involved. Most evolutionists even seem to believe that just the act of coming up with a story proves it all happened that way. It doesn't even have to be a good story. Just look at what's going on with Uranus and Neptune. Instead of acknowledging their creator, evolutionists would rather cling to a story that denies the very objects it's supposed to explain. Evolutionists need to make up stories about how evolution could have made the planets. How much worse of a story could you come up with than one that says the planets can't exist? Uranus and Neptune prove that it doesn't matter how bad the story is. For the evolutionist, any story is better than acknowledging the truth about their creator. These planets reveal the truth about the creation versus evolution debate. This is not a debate about religion versus science. If it were, there wouldn't be any scientists who believed in creation. But there are hundreds of degreed scientists who do believe in creation. No, this is a debate about the authority of the Bible as God's word. The Bible explains the scientific data far better than the evolutionary model. Plus, the Bible's truth is supported by evidence from archaeology, geology, history, and many other sources. Not to mention that as the word of God, the Bible stands on its own authority anyway. But none of that matters to evolutionists. Evolutionists have rejected the Bible because they don't want to be accountable to a creator. They would rather believe a model that says the gas giant planets cannot exist. You can decide for yourself whose model is the better match for the scientific evidence. So here's what you're not being told about Neptune. It looks young, not billions of years old. It generates energy, it's changing constantly, and it has the most violent winds in the entire solar system. Its magnetic field defies evolutionary models. And the biggest problem is this. According to evolution, it can't be there at all. <laughs>